This is America on the Road, winner of the International Automotive Media Conference Gold Medal Award for Radio, and now in its 24th year on the air. Thanks so much for being with us as we bring you the latest automotive information from around the world. America on the Road is brought to you by Driving Today and the Coalition for Vehicle Choice. I'm Jack Nerad. With me is Chris Teague. How are you doing today, Chris? As always, doing quite well today, Jack. It's always a pleasure to be here. Well, I'm so glad you're doing well all the time. I wish I could say that. Sometimes <laughs> I'm not doing so well, but <laughs> most of the time I'm, I'm doing just okay. Uh, and you are safely ensconced in Maine today, I understand. We have, though uh, the pandemic has left us with very few tourists. I have been seeing quite a few New York and Florida license plates, so it may end up being summer as usual here. Huh, interesting. Interesting. Uh, you know, even as uh, I think the uh, many East Coast states are banning people <laughs> from some West Coast states or from some other states or forcing them to quarantine for a couple of weeks. So I think that's going to put a little dent uh, in the tourist business. Well, as we have said on the show before, I'm on the West Coast. Chris is on the East Coast and uh, we cover all kinds of cars in between. And uh, we drive various cars uh, each week. And in our road, testament, uh, road test segment this week, I'm going to be driving or talking about the Kia Stinger that I recently drove. And uh, Chris, you were driving what? The 2020 Civic Honda Civic Hatchback. Uh-huh. Very practical vehicle, and uh, we'll see if it worked for your, your family of four. That'll be interesting to see. Uh, we're going to do that. We're also going to have a special guest his name is Jim Owens. He is with Ford and Ford Performance, and he's going to be talking about the Ford Shelby GT500. Uh, this is an interview that dates back uh, a couple of months or so. Uh, it's more difficult <laughs> to get hold of people these days, and I think this is an interview that's uh, worth hearing. It, it came when I was um, driving and uh, participating in the introduction of the Shelby GT500, so we will talk to him about that vehicle that's still very... Uh, Apropos these days, uh, new to the market. And uh, let's talk about news. What's what's cooking news-wise with you, Chris? It's a very busy news week all of a sudden, out of the blue. It seems like it's been quiet for quite a while now. Um, I saw earlier today and actually wrote about it earlier today that Mitsubishi is considering pulling back in the United States. Uh, we may not see so many new vehicles from them uh, in the near future. I think they're going to focus on Southeast Asia and Australia and those markets while um, Nissan and Renault, who are also in the alliance uh, with Mitsubishi, are going to focus on uh, North America and Europe, respectively. So uh, it could be an interesting shift. I think Mitsubishi has been a bit of an also ran for quite some time, um, not completely um, out of their control. However, they, you know, they've kind of let a few opportunities float past them, but I, I think it'll be sad because more choice i think is always better for consumers yeah i mean and it is kind of sad too in that uh, we just got the uh, jd power initial quality survey information today and among the takeaways was how well mitsubishi did uh <laughs> you know kind of out of the blue i think they're in the top five or you know certainly in the top 10 and uh so it's kind of disheartening news to think that the, they would pull out of this market absolutely i think they are seventh or eighth on the list but you know, I think they've had some issues uh, with quality in the past. It just takes a while to kind of get over those things. And some of their vehicles are not priced quite as competitively as they could be given the competition. But again, like you said, it'll be sad to see them go. Yeah, I think part of their problem is, is simple visibility. I mean, they, you know, when you're not selling a lot of vehicles, you're not making a lot of money and you don't have a lot of money to do advertising. And it's kind of a vicious cycle. Uh, it works the other way. When things are going well, uh, you have more money to advertise and you get the word out. Uh, so it is happening. Uh, there's a lot of Mitsubishi, uh, Mitsubishi vehicles that I like quite a bit. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of saddened to hear that. Yeah, it's nothing is uh, completely set in stone yet, but uh, we'll have to see how far they pull back. Right. Well, uh, we uh, talked a little bit about the uh, J.D. Power uh, initial quality uh, study that was released uh, very recently. Uh, as we're uh, recording this show. And uh, the interesting thing to me, well, <laughs> there's several interesting things, but maybe the most interesting thing is the number one uh, brand on the list, and it's kind of out of the blue, and that brand is Dodge. I agree, and was having a discussion with a colleague earlier that, you know, I guess that's the benefit of having quite a few vehicles with uh, aging platforms. So they've done a great job with technology and keeping them feeling rather fresh. It's just the benefit of not 
having, you know, very large updates every few years to some of these vehicles. Right. And uh, they've also, uh, each year, they've learned to screw those vehicles together better and better and better. <laughs> and I think another thing that uh, really stands in their favor, and uh, this is for, essentially for not just Dodge, but all cars that come from uh, Fiat Chrysler, is their infotainment systems. I mean, those uh, Uconnect inf infotainment systems are among the easiest to understand and operate of any vehicles on the market. And that is a gigantic advantage uh, in terms of initial quality because a lot of initial quality, and we're going to have uh, Dave Sargent of uh, JD Power on our show next week to talk about this in detail. But w one of the major things in initial quality is uh, people just don't get info infotainment systems very well. They have trouble with them. Uh, they report problems with them, and that results in a lot of dissatisfaction. I agree with everything you just said. The uh, Uconnect is one of the best in the market. I've, I've written those, those words more times than I could probably count. I should come up with a different way to say it by now. Well, and other things, and thanks so much for agreeing with me. I do appreciate it. You're not required to do that, of course. Uh, I'm on the North American Car of the Year jury, as you know. I'm, I'm pretty proud of that. And um, the jury has just announced the eligible vehicles for North American Car of the Year, North American Truck of the Year, and North American Utility of the Year. And without trying to play favorites, I will go over s at least some of them. It's interesting that the uh, utility of the year field is the largest by far these days, which really reflects what's going on in the marketplace. You know, a lot more introductions of cars, or utilities rather than uh, typical sedans, in, in the whole car marketplace. So um, that's alone pretty interesting. Uh, among the notable cars are the Acura TLX, the uh, BMW 3 Series, a lot of BMWs actually. Uh, the Genesis G80 is on the list. The Hyundai Elantra. Uh, there's going to be a new Lexus IS that I'd love to see and have, have yet to see. Uh, Mercedes-Benz is represented with uh, the E-Class. There's a new Mini Cooper. And the Nissan Sentra is also on the list among the... Uh, eligible cars of the year contenders. So it'll be interesting to see what our jury of 50-some uh, members uh, comes up with in terms of a North American Car of the Year. When that rolls around, it's going to roll around right after the first of uh, 2021. I always love seeing where you guys land, although it's not always where I think it's going to be. So I have to, I'm going to keep my opinions to myself, but uh, I have a few thoughts about where things might go. Yeah, well, to tell you the truth, it doesn't always go the way... I think it should go either, uh, but uh, that's we have a, a jury of 50 automotive experts from both Canada and the United States, and uh, it's always interesting to see where that lands, so we'll see about that and also see about the utility of the year and the truck of the year, uh, because uh, another bit of news uh, is the introduction of the all-new, at least they say all-new, uh, Ford F-150 pickup truck. Yeah, it looks an awful lot like the last F-150 pickup truck until you get inside where things have been updated quite substantially. Right. And we'll have an interview about that coming up in an upcoming uh, America on the Road uh, podcast. So look for that. And uh, I, I do look for that. That should be interesting stuff. And that's uh, soon to be uh, introduced and going out into the marketplace. You know, that's a gigantic important vehicle for Ford Motor Company. The F-150 is, uh, you know, one of the franchise players. So that's something that uh, they have to do well with, and uh, they're keeping after it. <laughs> well, speaking of Ford, our guest today on the show is Jim Owens, also of Ford, talking about the uh, Shelby GT500. Pretty cool car to talk about. He and I got together back when you could get together uh, in Las Vegas uh, at Las Vegas Motor Speedway. And, uh, you know, I got to drive and he got to talk about it. I think I got the best of it. Uh, but we will chat with him later in the show. And uh, before we do that, we will uh, road test some vehicles. We're going to road test the uh, Kia Stinger and the Honda Civic hatchback. So stay with us for that. That's coming up in the next segment. So stay with us right here on America on the Road. With Chris Teague, I'm Jack Nerad. We appreciate you being with us. 
Welcome back to America on the Road. It's Jackie Red back with you along with Chris Teague and our cross-country version of America on the Road. Thanks so much for being with us. It is road test time here on the show. And uh, Chris, you were behind the wheel of a, a vehicle that's a favorite of mine. It's certainly not the most expensive vehicle on, on the market pla- in the marketplace or on the market or any of those things. But uh, it's always a vehicle I enjoy driving and have uh, enjoyed driving for decades and decades now. And I'm talking about the Honda Civic and specific uh, the hatchback style of that vehicle. Tell us about it, would you? I agree. It's always a pleasure to test the, the Civic and, and one of its now many, I guess, forms. Um, I have the Sport Touring trim, which is the very top of the line model you can buy. And top of the line here doesn't mean, as you said, it's expensive. It's uh, still right around $30,000. And that's for literally everything that Honda could throw at it. And then some, uh, it had leather, uh, upholstery, heated seats, uh, Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, full suite of safety equipment, and uh, just a great looking car overall. And then, uh, you know, a little bit loud styling, probably if you're if you're in the mood for conservative uh, looks, maybe the, the Corolla is a better pick for you. Um, but the Honda Civic, the hatchback specifically, has much more space inside than I would have anticipated from looking at it from the outside. And that's complemented by the fact that it's very much a fun to drive car. Uh, I think a few weeks ago we talked about the Civic SI, which is almost the same body style, but with a little bit more horsepower and, and a six speed manual. Uh, this car, the Sport Touring that I just tested came with a 1.6 liter uh, four cylinder that made 180 horsepower. And that came with a CVT, which is a continuously variable transmission. Um, and if I had to knock the car for one thing in specific, it would probably be the CVT, uh, though Honda has done a better job than than some others. I think that the engine is uh, responsive. It sounds good, uh, but the transmission just sucks a little bit of that fun out. And I wish uh, that they all came with a six speed, though that would they probably wouldn't sell very many if they did. Um, I think from a comfort standpoint for people, you know, you and I have talked several times about the need uh, for families to, or the not having the need for families to buy an SUV every time they have a couple of kids and we survive just fine. There's more than enough room for large car seats in the back seat. And that still, like I said, leaves open the hatch area, which makes it such a more uh, practical car for families. Right. Well, let's uh, go back to the transmission a little bit. I mean, uh, certainly the reason that car companies are installing these CVTs, the continuously variable transmissions these days, is for fuel economy. I think they're probably in some ways simpler to build than a traditional automatic transmission as well. And I think for most drivers, they're just fine. They're probably not paying as much attention as we are to um, just the the niceties of uh, of how a transmission would work. And uh, so if there's a little buzziness here or a little, you know, something out of the ordinary there, it's, it's not a problem with them uh, so much as it is with us. I think we're, we're almost looking to find dirt there. And the, the advantages of, of a CVT are, are probably worth those little disadvantages, I think, especially to uh, the average buyer who is looking for better fuel economy. I agree. And as I said, you know, Honda has done such a great job with it that some of that, the buzziness or even the drone sound that kind of comes from some other companies, uh, CVTs is not here, is not in the Civic at all. It's, you know, it, it does a, a really good job of managing the the uh, the engine. So um, while I prefer the manual, the CVT is definitely not a bad option. Um, it just makes it, I think, a little bit less fun to drive, though. I think the car makes up for it in plenty of other ways. Yeah, and certainly you uh, mentioned how uh, commodious the interior is. Uh, it's it's really amazing the amount of interior space in a car that's uh, re- still reasonably small. Yeah, I had to I had to end up scooting the seat up quite a bit to actually find a, a driving position that let me see over the dash, and I'm a little bit over six feet tall, so there's definitely some room uh, to be worked with there more than you'd think from looking at it. Yeah. Well, certainly a, a great vehicle, and you know, one of the tops in its class. I think you mentioned one of the other tops in its class, and that's the Toyota Corolla, and those uh, kind of the gold standard in in that compact segment, and they have remained so for you know the better part of the last 25 years, uh, maybe longer. It'll probably continue to be that way for the next 25 as well, if if cars remain a thing. Yeah, well, I hope so. You know, until they uh, get uh, you know some other kinds of uh, personal transport, I think cars are going to be around for a while. So we shall see. <laughs> 
Well, I was driving the Kia Stinger, and I had the uh, kind of a zooty version of the Kia Stinger. It is a four-door uh, sedan. Uh, I had the GTS all-wheel drive V6, and wow, I mean, <laughs> there was a lot of performance here. And, you know, that's one of the head scratchers, actually, about the Kia Stinger. Um, it's a little bit of uh, an anomaly uh, in the Kia line. It's, not everything is all that sporty. And then you have this essentially sports sedan uh, that can very much compete with the likes of, uh, you know, some BMWs and Mercedes-Benz vehicles and uh, and. It just seems kind of out of character in a way. Um, plenty of horsepower. Uh, you know, the 3.3 liter twin turbo has something like 365 horsepower, so a lot of oomph. Uh, Eight-speed automatic transmission. I mentioned the fact that it's got all-wheel drive, which helps it hook up. And uh, mine was also in a really wild, and uh, my wife didn't really much care for it, but <laughs> it's in a wild exterior paint color called Federation Orange. Um, which is a little bit lighter than pumpkin orange, but, you know, it's real orange. It's not, like, kind of off orange. And so if you want to get attention, uh, that, maybe that's the way to go. You can certainly get attention by the way it drives, and, uh, you know, it feels terrific. Uh, plenty of, of acceleration, as I say. I like the, the way the all-wheel drive um, helps it hook up, and... Uh, it's also a very practical sedan, uh, given its performance capabilities. It's just one of those head scratchers where you go, yeah, I understand every piece of the hardware is great here, and uh, we understand that it's you know shared with uh, you know, Hyundai or a Genesis product, and maybe that makes sense. Just how does it fit in? And I guess that's we're reviewing the cars as opposed to the marketing and, and uh, product planning. Uh, but it's, it's one of those cars that uh, you just have to wonder about from, th from that point of view, not from the point of view of how good it is, because it's a terrific car. It is absolutely an oddball, but a great one. That the Kia and Hyundai both have come such a long way, but the interior of the, the Stinger, specifically in the higher trims, probably the one that you tested, is, is just it feels so much better than the price tag would suggest that you would get. Um, I mean, the, the Kia, the Stinger is definitely not a cheap car, but... Uh, I drove one last winter, and it handled its own in a snowstorm as well as any SUV that I've had. That's with all-wheel drive equipped, of course. And then, you know, we talked. We just talked about the Civic hatchback. The the Stinger's large, large uh, trunk hatch area is just as practical, if not way more so, because you know a larger car in general. Right. I mean, it's stuffed with features too. I mean, uh, I mentioned the all-wheel drive. It has limited slip differential. Uh, the vehicle we had it has navigation system. It had the Harman Kardon premium audio system, which sounds terrific. Uh, and it's a great system in, on which to listen to America on the Road. It had the Alcantara steering wheel, which I like. It's kind of a, a suede-like feel under your hands. It's almost like um, the steering wheel itself is wearing driving gloves. You don't wear driving gloves, though, do you, Chris? I don't, but I do love some good uh, Alcantara. <laughs> yeah, well, a lot of us do. And uh, with gravy and maybe some mashed potatoes on the side, it's it's just really terrific. Um, this is a, a pricey vehicle, at least the way I uh, tested it. It was $47,670 in terms of MSRP. So, you know, that's quite a piece of change. It's quite a piece of change for a, a Kia. Uh, but the the upside is it's probably... Uh, providing you the performance and um, creature comforts of vehicles that uh, maybe cost fifty or sixty thousand dollars if they come from Germany and they wear one of those German nameplates and a better warranty to boot. Yes, indeed. So that is what we have to say about the uh, Kia Stinger, and uh, we like it. Certainly, one to pay attention to. It, of course, I think a lot of people are paying attention to the Honda Civic hatchback, so we don't have to give that quite a, quite as strong an endorsement. Uh, but these are both good vehicles that uh, have their idiosyncrasies, and uh, so that's, that's where we stand on those. When we come back, we will be uh, taking some listener questions. We will be talking, taking your questions and uh, providing answers uh, to your automotive questions, so uh, we look forward to that, and so stay with us. This is Jack Red along with Chris Teague, and thanks so much for being with us on America on the Road. 
Welcome back, everybody, to America on the Road with Chris Teague. This is Jack New Red back with you, and it is question and answer time right here on America on the Road, a segment that we, we love to participate in uh, because we like taking your questions and we like helping you out with knowledge we've gained through the years, uh, some m- many more years than others on this show, but uh, we've both been around the car business a long time and have uh, gathered a lot of information, so we're happy to share it and hope to help. And... Uh, Chris, I, I know we have uh, at least one or two listener questions. What's what's the first question for us? Sure. Well, with summer coming up, this is a very appropriate question. One of our listeners wants to know, what's the best way to take care of a convertible top, keep it clean, um, and wash it? Well, washing it is important, number one. I, I mean, a lot of people just kind of throw up their hands when they look at a convertible top, and um, or they just treat it like it's part of the rest of the car, which I guess it is, but it needs to be treated in a different way than the rest of the car. And uh, a couple things to ask yourself, and uh, maybe others, uh, is, you know, what is the top made of? Is it made of fabric or is it made of vinyl? Uh, Because you need products that are appropriate for the material that the uh, top is made of. Um, And then you have to give it a, a good scrubbing, probably at least monthly, uh, and at the same time being gentle enough not to damage the material because obviously uh, I think it's pretty obvious that fabric and vinyl is not as durable as uh, painted sheet metal, uh, which the rest of your car probably is. Um, so those are the things. Uh, using products that are appropriate and designed strictly for the particular top is important. Having a nice scrub brush that has bristles that are Um, Not too um, hard, not too abrasive uh, is important because you want to get the grit and dirt out of of the top, but uh, you certainly don't want to damage the top itself. And you have to be cognizant all the time that a convertible top is uh, more fragile than, again, paint and sheet metal. Uh, So you have to treat it that way. And maintaining it and then treating it, treating it with a product, a protectant, basically, you know, much as you would wax your car uh, using a convertible top treatment kind of product, uh, you know, after you've washed it, after you've dried it with microfiber towels, after you've been very gentle with it, um, those are some important things to, to know about uh, washing your convertible top. Sounds reasonable that just jamming it through the touchless car wash is probably a bad idea. Yeah, I mean, getting... Uh, car wash soap on it, you know, the standard kind of stuff. And there's so many household products that people use that uh, could damage the top or they certainly could could damage the rear window in the convertible top, especially if it's a plastic rear window. I mean, ammonia, uh, vinegar, you know, all kinds of things that people might use. I'm not sure anybody uses ammonia anymore. Uh, (laughs) Ammonia seems like out of the 1930s or something. But, um, you know, a typical cleaning product uh, that you're going to find under the sink, probably not really appropriate for cleaning your convertible top. Makes sense. Yeah. Well, here's a question for you. If you had to uh, buy a full-size sport utility today, or maybe tomorrow, what is the sport utility that you would look to buy? Well, geez, that's a really tough one because mid-size utilities have gotten so good and the third row seats and many of them are big enough that a lot of people probably wouldn't even need to consider a full-size suv but i'm still in the chevy suburban camp i think i've been a fan of the suburban for a long time and they've just really nailed down the formula uh, with comfort they've had uh, chevy's infotainment system is more than decent and uh, i think they look great too now they're pricey uh, that's a little bit of a downside, but I think that once you enter that arena, you're kind of looking um, at a steep price tag uh, no matter where you go. The the Ford Expedition is another great one. Um, you can get that in a stretched version, uh, but it's uh, I think it is equally as attractive from a styling standpoint if you can call um, a semi-school bus-sized vehicle attractive. Um, but I think either one of those would be a very good choice, but my, my pick would be giving the edge to the Chevy. Yeah, you know, I'm right with you, and uh, the uh, Nirad family drives a uh, Chevy Tahoe, which is, you know, closely related to the Suburban. And it, it seemed like for a long time, there were years and years and years, where Ford had essentially kind of given up on that. There was still an expedition out there, but it was just getting older and older and older. And the Suburban and Tahoe dominated 
And then Ford decided, hey, we're not going to let this happen anymore, and we have a pretty good underpinnings for um, big SUVs in our Ford F-150 pickup truck. So they rejuvenated both the Expedition and uh, also the Lincoln um, and uh, decided uh, they were going to play in that segment uh, in a way that they had not before uh, in quite a while. So uh, those are reasonable choices, and yet I, I still favor the uh, Suburban and Tahoe. And they've been rejuvenated uh, this year, I mean very early this year, and it kind of went under the radar because all of a sudden the pandemic hit, and uh, <laughs> we've been dealing with that ever since. Yeah, well, that's unfortunate on many, many, many levels, but for Chevrolet specifically, it's unfortunate because it is a great vehicle. Right. And uh, definitely one to look at. So those are those are some questions and answers we've had uh, this week. Uh, to reach us, we'd love to get your automotive question. Automotive question be fine. And if you have questions about other things, we're maybe willing to answer that too. But uh, the way to reach us is by um, emailing to editor at drivingtoday.com. Editor at drivingtoday.com. Of course, uh, Driving Today is our um, website, sister website to uh, America on the Road. And, We'd love to get your automotive question, and we'll try to provide you with an answer on an upcoming show. So that's how you go about doing that, and uh, that is our question and answer time. When we come back, we will be talking with Jim Owens. He is with Ford Motor Company, talking about the Ford Shelby GT500. Really cool car. Had a chance to drive that at uh, Las Vegas Motor Speedway before everything came to a screeching halt. Uh, and so we'll talk with him about that vehicle and about Mustangs and pony cars and the origin of all, all that. And uh, so they'll be coming up in the next segment. So stay with us. With Chris Teague, this is Jack Nerad, and we appreciate you being with us on America on the Road. Welcome to America on the Road. This is Jack Nerad, and with us is Jim Owens. He is the marketing manager for the Ford Shelby GT500, and we're going to talk to him right now. So let's go to that interview. Well, we are in uh, at Las Vegas Motor Speedway. I guess right north of Vegas. I can see downtown Vegas from, from where we're sitting. Uh, we hear the track noise behind us. It is the introduction of the Shelby GT500. Um, we're having more fun than any humans should really be allowed to have, you know, especially without paying a lot of money. It's a tough day at work. <laughs> yeah. So, so talk a bit about this car. Uh, you know, um, we've kind of got the nuts and bolts. Tell us what excites you about this car. What, uh, you know, what, uh, what people should be uh, gravitating to when they... So, I mean, and as you're aware, Mustang has been around for 55 years. And if you think about it back in the day, um, Lee Iacocca and the Fairlane Committee was looking for a car that could capture the hearts and minds of the baby boom generation who had, you know, the ended World War II, coming back into the 50s, had disposable income, but wanted that sense of freedom. And that car didn't exist at that time. And so they came up with the two seat and, you know, Mustang back in 63 or 62, we showed it actually a concept right. car at Watkins Glen. 55 years later, that car continues to evolve. And what you're going to experience and what you've experienced today is the top of that pinnacle of Mustang performance. And, you know, from 760 horsepower and the fastest production Mustang on the road course and the fastest production Mustang on a drag strip in a straight line, meaning it can do both things. It is a great athlete and as best as we have produced in the Mustang lineup. And when you do that drag strip start and you feel the G-forces pulling you in the center of your back in a sub-11 second quarter mile yes. and a trap speed of about 138, there's a lot of things that go on in life that can be forgotten and get a big, huge smile on your face as you're looking up at that screen and go, I just ran in a 10, 8, 2. So that's one of the favorite things I have. You know, if you think about it, the GT500 back in the day when Carol did it, um, it was a straight line car. Right. Right. It was a big, you know, it had that big. Well, interesting, nose. though, because he was a road racer. He, I mean, he really was a road racer more so than a, a drag racer. That's for certain. Yeah, he but, did but dabble the, in the he did dabble yeah. in the drag racing. He yeah. didn't race it though necessarily. Right. But remember, he brought in uh, Don Prudhomme. Right. And did the Super Snake drag strip. You know, as with I well, well remember, Shelby yeah, Motor in it. Yeah. And so I mean, he he didn't race himself drag strip. You know, he grew up in that Texas and riding the dirt the dirt courses. Yeah, and oddly drove for for 
Ferrari. Well, <laughs> he actually, I mean, and there's a huge story with it. And Carol loved to tell stories. And, you know, 30% of them were tr- accurate. And 100% of them had accurate stories in there. Yeah. Um, but, we, yeah, so he was the only human being to win as a driver, as a manufacturer, and as a team owner in Lamar. He's the only human on the planet who's ever done that. Um, and he won in 57 as a driver, not for Ford. Um, he won with the Daytona Coupes and the Co- the Cobra Daytona Coupes. Right. You know, back with Peter Brock and the design and that back square. And you know, we saw that at the dinner last night. We saw the the Daytona yeah, Coupe that yeah, actually yeah, won Lamar. Yeah, yeah. Brought me um, back to my Motor Trend days. Yeah. Uh, you know, and then I, back to the yeah. GT40, where Carol and his merry band of hot rodders and Holman Moody working on the engines with them. They came and took the Ford GT40 program from you know the first year where we didn't finish a race, second year where we didn't make a podium, and the third year where we actually won from 66 67 68 and 69 yeah, so amazing. yes you're right he didn't do much drag racing but he did understand what horsepower meant and one of the applications of horsepower that you can get to the street is that drag racing and so yes what is the cool feeling of it that center pole yeah. is great yeah I mean, with that kind of horsepower, I mean, that's unimaginable horsepower in the muscle car days, right? <laughs> I mean, 300 horsepower, maybe 400 horsepower. I think 500 horsepower was beyond the realm. You know, if you got a horsepower per cubic inch, you were really kicking butt in those days. How do you get there? And, and, and how, and number, not only that, I, I get how you can get there technically. How do you get a corporation like Ford Motor Company to go, this is okay. You know, in fact, not only is this okay, this is going to be a flagship for our brand. So if you look at it, Carol had a huge impact on that, right? When, when we did the 05 and 06 Ford GT program, um, that's when Carol kind of came back into the fold. Um, when we started to do that program, everybody agreed that we needed Carol back in, right? If we were going to do something 40 years later, we needed to have him in. And so we brought him back in. Um, Workhorse One is sitting in the museum, right? I don't know if you saw that over there. That was the first workhorse from the 0506 GT program. Anyways, we were launching the fifth generation of Mustang right after that. That was 2005. And our 4.6 liter V8 had 300 horsepower. I mean, I launched that one and I was so excited that we had it. Carol came in at that point in time and we said, it's time to bring back the GT500 name. You know, because we had called yeah. that the Cobras before, right? SVT, yeah, right. 0304 Terminator program, right? Independent rear suspension, blown eight cylinder. Um, so when we were doing the next generation SVT and performance derivative, we brought Carol in. Carol always wanted more horsepower and that pursuit of that horsepower when we were first working on it ellen collins was the program manager at the time and she's like jimmy i'm only gonna get 425 out of it and carol's like no <laughs> you know i need more than that and then she gets 475 and we announced it first at 450 and then we said 475 and then finally they pushed 500 horsepower out of it now that was back in 07 model year as we developed that program Carol would keep pushing those engineers with that spirit that Carol had to continue to develop it because that actually proved things that the engineers could do that would translate to the cars and trucks that were on the street. Mm. So that by the time when the last car that he launched with us was the 13 Shelby GT500 in LA, that one had 662 horsepower. And now the Ford Performance team has brought it up to 760. So the company sees the performance aspect that builds to that icon and part of that performance equation is horsepower yeah well and forced induction i mean certainly forced induction is something that is across the board now at ford motor company talk a bit about that so you know and it's it's kind of fun if you think about it you know i told you that the 05 you know had 300 horsepower out of our v8 our 2.3 liter eco boost which is that eco boost power which is forced air induction on the turbo basis has more than 315 horsepower in its base model you know so from gen 5 to gen 6 that technology is improved and then it also is more fuel efficient right um it you if you're not going to be going stoplight to stoplight on Woodward Avenue between 13 and 14 mile and jumping into the throttle and you want to drive normally, then it provides you not only the performance aspect of it, but then also the efficiency aspect of it when you don't want it. Um, The prime example of it is that Ford GT program that we did for 17. 
a lot of us hardcore were like, let's kill them with displacement, right? That's what yeah, Carol did yeah. back in the day. And what the engineers came back and said is, look, if I can give you an EcoBoost V6 that has lower package width, lower package depth, lower weight, and still can give you 647 horsepower, you know, that makes the You're design. not gonna say no to no, that. <laughs> right? Because then the design, you can efficiently design it. So the Ford Motor Company, even back from, think of, you know, the the SVO Mustang, remember the four-cylinder turbo charge, sure. uh, the, the, the uh, Motor Trend Car of the Year, a 1986 Turbo Coupe. Remember that? I, I was there. I was editor of Motor Trend then, so I remember it fairly. <laughs> I remember the cover <laughs> yeah, shot yeah, you guys yeah, did yeah. with it. And and so we've been doing turbos over a period of time. Right. Um, but in, in today's, it becomes an opportunity to allow efficiency with performance. Yeah. yeah. How important is um, the Shelby name to this whole program? What does that mean to you? So, I mean, you know, me personally, I worked for Carroll for four years, um, left Ford, went to work for Carroll, and then came back to do Ford stuff. Um, to the Ford Motor Company, um, Shelby, you know, helped usher us into being able to beat Enzo, <laughs> right? Because when when Henry Ford, when the dudes wanted to go back and right. buy Enzo, yeah. right, buy Ferrari, and then came back out and said, hey, we're going to come back and we're going to kick your butt, um, we brought in Carol and Holman Moody team and, and to help do that. I think there's a parallel, though, between the Ford family as well. If you think about it, Edsel worked for Carol when he was a teenager. No, I didn't realize that. That's Carol made him knew. wash transmission yeah. parts in the <laughs> shop and lived with him. He lived with Carol for the summer in between right. his college years. And, you know, Etzel was out in Le Mans in 66 when we won. Um, so that connection for the Ford family to the Shelby family, I think, is important. Um, you know, Ford Motor Company is not just a company, right? When, you, when you're in Dearborn, people say they work for the Fords. Yeah. Right. It's it not, is still a family company in in so many ways. It's so amazing ways. that a global company of its scale is still looked at that way. And but it's true. You know, Bill is a huge Mustang fan. Elena's a big Mustang fan. Edsel, huge, still Mustang fan as well, and a performance and racing fan. And that connection, you know, from a family representing this company and the Shelby family and a name representing, you know, the performance side of the business, it makes a pretty strong parallel. Um, but he's done so much beyond performance. You know, if you think about it, it's an American success story. He was a World War II instructor pilot. He went out and the son of a postal worker. He was, you know, trying to be a chicken farmer and was actually pretty successful until a virus came in and killed all the chickens in there. He used to come out from the chicken farms that he was trying to work at to rebuild his chicken farm in his chicken farmer suit to go race. You know, so you take somebody from the humble beginnings to the, you know, Sports Illustrated car of the year or driver of the year two years in a row as the only person who was ever that, that is a huge American success story that people from four-year-olds who are playing with their little Hot Wheels cars of their Shelby GT500 to the 100-year-olds, that it makes a connection beyond just the performance. Yeah. We were talking last night, and it was comical in a way, but also, I think, very telling about folks who wear Shelby underwear. Tell that story. <laughs> So, and so when I talk about the, the passionate people and, and you know, not, a, not describing them as a demographic, right? Kind of like what is a psychographic of it? Um, when I was VP of Shelby and I was helping on the licensing side, we signed an underwear company, a boxer underwear company, who wanted to put Shelby on boxer shorts. I'm like, okay, fine, we sign it. We, that, that licensee is still there. You can go now on eBay right now or you know, go on Google and search for it. The people who wear Shelby underwear, that's the Shelby underwear wearing crowd. And that's how much they love that brand. And it's a way to describe it. That not only do they wear it on their shirts, external, but they'll wear it on their boxer shorts when they go to bed at night. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's dear to their heart and there's that passion about it. Shifting gears. Um, as you go forward, you know, 760 horsepower, I mean, is a thousand horsepower something you're thinking about? Is electrification something you're thinking about? At least adding, adding torque through electrification, kind of getting free torque that way. What are some of the things that we're going to see going forward? So in the performance side, and remember, I'm on the marketing side. I'm, I'm not in the engineering, don't have an engineering degree. I do have a seat of the pants. I spend a lot of time on the track. Sure. Yeah. What you're always looking for is the best way to derive the performance on the track. Um, and, 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 you know, racers, 
will look for that extra tenth of a second regardless of what it what it is. Um, Carol, in his day, used to say, oh, I put more businesses into the ground than I made successful. You know, he was always experimenting. One of the stories that I like to tell is he tried and set up a volcanic ash brake pad company. Okay. And his thought process was this. Hey, the heat dissipates pretty quick when the lava comes out of those volcanoes. And then it dissipates pretty quick and then it hardens in solid. He goes, what if there are properties in there that can actually dissipate heat better and make my brake pads better? Yeah. And he invested money in it and it didn't end up working. But my point for bringing it up is you look at different type of technologies to improve the performance of your vehicle and that's what performance folks do right we're looking for whatever we can to take off that next tenth of a second off of our lap time yeah how fast can we go i mean uh, you know uh, when i first got in this business i think a car that won motor trends import car of the year was doing zero to 60 in 12 seconds it was a bmw 3 series of about 1982 83 yeah, I mean, that was the era, you know, I mean, yep. it was a, a fuel economy era, it was an emissions era, and we were getting to know that. Now we're, we're seeing SUVs that are going zero to 60 in four seconds, <laughs> less than four seconds. <laughs> we have an Explorer SD yeah, yeah, out there yeah, that's yeah, pretty right. powerful, right. 400 yeah. plus horsepower. Yeah, so talk about that a little bit before so, I let you go. Yeah, so, um, let me say this, it's, it, you never know what the limits are, right? Um, the parallel I draw is to like, um, let's say a Prince tennis racket like that Serena Williams plays with, right? I grew up with a John McEnroe racket that was wooden. Wooden, right. And it was- The sweet spot was like that big. That big, right? <laughs> and as that technology grows, right, the size of it goes, and you know, Serena Williams can hit 130 mile an hour serve with those new, you know, carbon fiber composite rackets that are computer strung, that technology. And when if you would have sat there and told me, you know, back in the day when I was playing with my wooden John rack and row that, you know, somebody would be serving over a hundred miles an hour, you know, that technology advances and the sport continues to advance. And so on the performance side, as that technology goes, it's going to advance that performance and probably some of the things that are gonna come out to it is quicker acceleration. Right, because you know, the faster you can get out of that turn, the faster your lap time is. The right. faster you can get out of the box, the lower that your lap time is going to be. And and so that would be an output of pursuing performance, which is what we've been doing at Ford Performance. You know, yeah. if you think about it, Henry. Yeah. Do you ever get to, you know to feeling that maybe? Um we're going to get to a point where the human body can't deal with it. I mean, literally, you know that that we ha we already right. This vehicle probably would not be as fast with uh, without all the driver aids, right? If you turn all the driver aids off, you're not going to be as fast as you would as you drive with the driver aids on. So at some point, it's like you're almost a passenger, right? You're, you're kind of steering maybe, <laughs> but yeah, you, you know where I'm going with this. Talk yeah, about that. Well, I mean, if you look at it, you know the the parallel and like when Melvin designed, Melvin Betancourt designed the GT500 and he went to the aero and to planes and to the fighter jets as some of the inspiration that you can see in those beautiful lines. Yeah. Um, you know, those fighter jets are fly by wire, but there's still a pilot behind it. The drones are not doing the fighter pilot stuff, right? Yeah, right. Um, so they help, they me, who's an average driver at best. Um, those things help me, but Billy Johnson, who was, I don't know if you got a ride yet from Billy or from Steve, they don't need all of those things to take that performance to that same level. So what that technology has allowed us to do is to make, you know, mere mortals feel like they're Mario Andretti or Sir Jackie Stewart, right? right. And, and that will continue, but you know, the hardcore race car folks, you know, when they go in there, those race cars like the GT4 program, who, you know, with Billy Johnson winning in the GT4 program, that didn't have all of that electronics on it, yeah. right? That still had that physical, you know, physics, downforce, aero, horsepower, suspension setups that he took and could make that thing perform, you know, to a championship level. But the technology that's in there today can make you and I feel really confident when we're on the track. Right. Absolutely true. Uh, I'm more confident than I should probably feel. That's, that's <laughs> for certain. So uh, give us the... Uh, you know the facts about intro date um you know some some sense of pricing all of that for 
uh, Shelby GT. Yeah, 500. so the, it starts at 73, you know, 73, 995. Um, and includes then you know, de destination and delivery and then the federal government gas guzzler tax. Um, you can take it up over 100, um, but everything from a performance standpoint can be had for $97,000. Right, the, the painted over the top stripes is a $10,000 option and people say, whoa, 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 that's pretty expensive. Well, we're actually underneath the clear coat, so it has to go through multiple it's times. A through the paint. It's yeah, a process, it's a process situation, right. So all the performance stuff can be had for 97 grand. Actually, probably a little, actually lower, because you don't really need the electronics, the B&O system to go that fast. Right. Um, so you can, somewhere between 73,000 and you know, 97,000, you can get a car that goes, you know, zero to 60 in mid threes, and can go sub 11 second quarter mile, and can do VIR in the fastest lap time possible. Yeah, yeah, great. Well, Jim Owens, thanks so much for being with us. We really do appreciate it. You're um, delightful to talk to about this thing. I, I sense your enthusiasm, uh, and I understand why, too, having driven this car, so. Yeah, and it's a lot of fun, Jack. We truly appreciate it, and you can tell there's a lot of us who are passionate about this, and from that passion and technology can come cars like this wonderful 2020 Shelby GT500. Yeah. And that was our interview with Jim Owens of Ford talking about the Shelby GT500. What a blast we had that day, and I look forward to days like that coming up in the future. Again, our, our thanks to Jim Owens for that opportunity to chat with him about that. And uh, it's always a great opportunity to talk with you, Chris Teague. Uh, thanks for co-hosting the show again this week. I really do appreciate it. hope things are going swell in Maine and uh, <laughs> going, going great for your family. So appreciate that. They are. Thank you for asking and saying that. And thank you for having me. And thanks everyone for listening to me and Jack rambling on about uh, anything under the sun that comes to our minds. And I will remind everyone, as has become tradition, to uh, wherever you get your podcasts, subscribe to our, our feed and like us, leave us a review so we can continue to climb up the charts. And as Jack always says, chase popularity, because that's what's most important in life. Uh, but very much a fun time, and I look forward to next week. I do as well. Thanks so much for being with us, and thank you to the listeners for being with us as well. Uh, we enjoy it, and there would be no reason to do this without you. So uh, join us again next time on America on the Road. For Chris Teague, this is Jack Nered saying thanks a lot, and we'll talk to you soon.